Hello and welcome back to this week's edition of Foreign Correspondents. I'm Somi Zoram with our panel of foreign journalists. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Tis the season of summits these days, with a series leading up to the Kim Trump meeting to be followed by even more afterwards. So, how busy have you been in reporting these summits? It's been quite busy. I, uh, the, the last week, I think we are now more focusing on this particular summit and narrowing down what the issues are that go are going to be discussed and the gap between North Korea and the U.S. position on denuclearization. Okay. And at least? Yeah, so a lot of the conversations uh, leading into this summit now have really been about expectation setting, right? And what the Trump administration is going to concede, if anything, um, what's going to happen next. Right. We expect a flurry of diplomacy coming out of this summit, and so there's already talk about Pompeo going to China and Pompeo coming to South Korea eventually as well. So uh, we're already kind of looking ahead. Okay, and Lena? Yeah, I mean, same. We've, um, when I came here, I've only been here for three months. I expected that the, this week I'd be busy with the local elections <laughs> right. in South Korea. Um, I did not think I'd be in Singapore watching nuclear diplomacy. Okay. All right, from summit agenda and location to security and protocol, all that's related to the Kim Trump meeting is a newsworthy topic. But the most central of them all, undoubtedly, is denuclearization. So this week on Foreign Correspondence, our topic is Pyongyang's denuclearization scenario. North Korea's denuclearization efforts are starting to gain traction on the eve of the Trump-Kim summit. And I told them today, take your time. We go fast, we go slowly. But the process will begin on June 12th in Singapore. On May 24th, North Korea dismantled its nuclear test site at Pungeri, one of the key locations that symbolized the country's nuclear ambitions for the last 11 years. Although the test site dismantling was an important first step that demonstrated North Korea's willingness to lay down its nuclear arms, bolder and more concrete steps are still needed to achieve the complete denuclearization being demanded by the United States. The Libya and Iran models have been frequently raised as possible benchmarks for North Korea's denuclearization. However, some experts say the unique situation surrounding North Korea creates difficulties in using these models as a solution. In response, the Trump administration has said it would focus on its own Trump model to devise a solution. This is uh, the President Trump model. He's going to run this the way he sees fit. Uh, we're 100% confident, as we've said many times before, and as we all know that you're aware, he's the best negotiator. North Korea stands to receive many benefits if it carries through on its promise to completely denuclearize. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo has promised to guarantee the North Korean regime's security as a reward for complete denuclearization. Many conversations have been had about how we might proceed, what the path might be forward, so that we can achieve both the denuclearization that the world demands of North Korea and the security assurances that would be required for them to allow us to. The costs associated with denuclearization and economic aid measures to North Korea are also important issues that need to be discussed. On June 1st, President Trump named South Korea as the key player to lead the efforts in providing economic aid to North Korea, suggesting that Seoul's government will shoulder the largest burden of the reward portion of North Korea's denuclearization costs. Well, I don't think the United States is going to have to spend. I think South Korea will do it. In this week's edition of Foreign Correspondents, we sit down with a panel of journalists to discuss North Korea's denuclearization process and the various different scenarios that could play out. North Korea has announced its intention to denuclearize, while the U.S. has promised to provide security guarantees for the regime. However, Pyongyang does have a checkered history of backtracking from previous agreements, so how much can they be trusted this time around? 
That's the big question. The Trump administration continues to say that the model that will be followed for denuclearization will be unlike any in the past where sanctions and relief was given for uh, promises of dismantlement of uh, nuclear facilities. But it is unclear what this model will be and to what extent the, the Trump administration is willing to compromise to get North Korea to agree to some level of denuclearization. The Trump administration wants North Korea to completely and irreversibly end its nuclear program. North Korea wants a more measured and, and long-term process where they get some sanctions relief for some early types of uh, concessions from their side. And so uh, we don't know what that final deal will look like. And in, there's been message discipline on both sides. There's been less attacks coming from both sides. And the U.S. has been indicating um, a little bit more flexibility in its position. Mm -hmm. Okay, and Lena, what's your opinion? I think the um, key point with the, um, with the denuclearization effort is going to be about irreversibility and verifiability, mm -hmm. right? Because the Trump administration says eventually they want a complete abolition of nukes in North Korea and, and they want it to be irreversible so they can never build it back and they want it to be verified by international inspectors. Um, all of these things are very difficult to achieve because nobody actually knows how many nuclear facilities North Korea has. There's a few known ones, they've dismantled one, well, maybe two. We don't know where any of the other ones are. It's completely possible that they're hiding them right. in various places around the country. Um, and unlike in Iran and Libya, for instance, where it was very obvious where the nuclear facilities were and international inspectors had access to these places, we haven't had that kind of access in North Korea. Right, okay. So, continuing on from Lena's response, as the first step towards denuclearization, Pyongyang dismantled its Punggye nuclear test ground. Do you believe this was carried out in that complete irreversible manner? Uh, well, there were no actual experts allowed mm -hmm. into that May 24th demolition, and so there's really no way to say, but a lot of outside observers have argued that, you know, whilst tunnels did collapse, that they could, you know, restart Punggye-ri right. um, with not too much effort. And so, uh, more than anything else, I thought May 24th was symbolic, right? Mm -hmm. It was a show in advance of the summit to say, hey, you know, Kim Jong-un is trying to uh, show that he's acting in good faith, right? Um, the big problem with North Korea in the past has always been that they've been considered bad faith actors. Uh, American negotiators certainly lost a lot of trust. But the Punggye-ri is a step. But I think most nuclear experts will tell you that it, it was just a, just a show. Just a show. Then continuing on from that, what about the transparency of it? North Korea has claimed that the dismantling was con carried out in a, quote, transparent manner. Do you agree? No, uh, there weren't. They actually uh, originally said they would allow in out outside experts mm -hmm. to verify and, and had not followed up on that promise right. by allowing them and, and brought in journalists. They not, only, uh, they, they not only controlled what journalists could see and where they could be, but they also took away any equipment that the journalists would bring to measure radiation right. uh, output from, from the site. So they are making promises about transparency and cooperation, but these are all vague at this point. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, now on May 9th, Trump pulled out of the Iran nuclear deal. What do you think his reasoning was behind that decision? Well, he never liked it and he railed against it. Well, the thing with American policy that we're seeing lately is that um, policy is being reverse engineered mm -hmm. to match pro proclamations that President Trump made on the campaign trail or just kind of made off the cuff even without being educated on right. it. Um, President Trump, you know, is somebody who famously makes gut decisions based on television or based on, you know, um, Reddit threads, so social media. And so uh, he will often do that and in this case decided because this was uh, negotiated during the Obama administration, mm -hmm. he never liked it, right? Um, so it could be personality. It could be the fact that you know Iran was obeying the letter of the uh, agreement, but not the spirit of the agreement. Um, but either way, uh, this is something that there was a lot of administration back and forth about trying to keep, you know, and trying to be a part of until ultimately the the members of the administration who supported the Iran deal were vanquished. Right, and so. Um, uh, like a lot of American policy that we've seen in the Trump administration, 
uh, I would argue that it was reverse engineered to match the president's proclamations, mm -hmm. not necessarily for a substantive policy reason. Right, okay. Then do you think a part of the reasoning had to do with sending some sort of message to North Korea? I'm doubtful mm -hmm. about that point. I think that's um, that was a very useful thing for him to claim, as Elise was just saying, retrospectively. You know, right. it really matched the rhetoric. It said, well, you know, we're telling this guy um, that if you don't abide by the spirit of the agreements that we make, then um, we're just going to walk away from the table. Um, I also think it was probably a very unwise thing to do if indeed it was intended to send a message to North Korea because it basically said America can't be trusted. Mm -hmm. You make an agreement, you pull out of it, even though um, by the letter of the agreement the other party is adhering to it. Um, that's not a particularly good starting point for trying to enter into a very difficult negotiation process with uh, what is de facto a nuclear power. Right. Okay, now going back to the US, the US Secretary of Defense said last week that sanctions on North Korea will not be eased until North Korea takes concrete steps toward verifiable and irreversible denuclearization. So with that being said, what kind of time frame are we looking at, do you think? Uh, Stanford University just did a, uh, a roadmap mm -hmm. to denuclearization and they broke it down into three phases, with one phase being basically a freeze and uh, limits on current capabilities, the second phase being a pullback, uh, the first phase taking one year, mm -hmm. the second phase taking five years and being a pullback uh, on these capabilities, starting to reduce them and complete elimination uh, would take at least a decade. Okay. You know, it seems to be that, that Siegfried Hecker and uh, Bob Carlin report out of Stanford University seems to be kind of the uh, pervasive or the um, understood quoted, norm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, about denuclearization processes, right? That it would take at least 15 years. Right. That sounds right. I mean, this is a pretty developed nuclear program, unlike Ukraine and Libya mm -hmm. and Iran, which we've discussed. Uh, you know, what's interesting to me about all of this is that U.S. administrations constantly change, and because of the nature of the Kim Jong or the Kim regime. Uh, it doesn't really change, right? Like the, the same family has been in charge right. since the beginning of the country. And so that gives them a real built-in advantage here, not only in negotiation, but also in um, policy, right? Because uh, their system allows it. So I, I'll be interested to see what happens if there is kind of a slow phased denuclearization, um, what happens when our Congress changes in the US and then our administrations then change. Okay. Now another sticking point that must be addressed is where the nuclear weapons will be dismantled. Will it be within Pyongyang, transported to the US as John Bolton suggested, or a third country? What's your take? Past experience with countries like Ukraine, uh, their nuclear weapons were shipped to Russia. It's hard to say if North Korea would agree to dismantle and ship out all of its nuclear weapons. There has been speculation that that will be the next big demonstration mm -hmm. of North Korea's commitment that the, the Kim government will offer up a, a number of its nuclear warheads uh, to be sent out or dismantled. Uh, and, but also, but there's also concern or there has been a perceived reservation on Pyongyang's side in that they, they don't want the world to know exactly how developed they are on their, nu uh, on their nuclear uh, program. And so by giving out any of these nuclear warheads, they would give outside inspectors the opportunity to see you know, exactly what these devices are, how effective they are, what the range are. Elena? Mm -hmm. I think that's right. I mean, th there's, a, there's a tension there between the North's intention to show their goodwill and say, look, we're serious about this dismantlement and their desire to maybe hang on to some sense of mystery about how far they've actually got and how mm -hmm well developed their, their nuclear program is. I think in terms of countries, um, there's some talk, some of the people I've spoken to seem to think that Europe was a more likely place for them to ship them out. So not directly to America, because mm -hmm. that would be seen as too much of a concession, but maybe to somewhere like France, mm -hmm. where there's a, long, a large number of nuclear scientists who can look at these things and sort of assess exactly how, how far they've got and, and how much of a concession the shipment represents in any particular case. So I think that could happen. Um, Okay. I mean, you never know. <laughs> All right. Now let's now move on to the economics of denuclearization. It's been said that it will cost up to billions, if not tens of billions of US dollars to denuclearize North Korea. Who do you think will end up paying for this bill? <laughs> President Trump says he's just going to like send that, send the 
uh, bill over to South Korea and Japan, right? Which was a really interesting throwaway comment. Um, but I don't think that's necessarily going to be the case. I still argue that whatever the cost of um, the denuclearization process, it's still much, much cheaper and less catastrophic than any sort of military option, right. including even a bloody nose strike that was discussed last fall, right? Because even that would have um, had unsort uh, all sorts of incalculable consequences and cascading effects. Now, continuing on from that, the uh, economic rewards or the economic aid to be given to North Korea Trump has singled out, uh, he hasn't singled out, but he mentioned South Korea, Japan, and China as the countries that will be leading the financial aids for North Korea. What's your take? I suspect South Korea has intentions to significantly uh, invest and, and provide uh, significant investment and assistance in North Korea to improve economically. Uh, it will, both countries also, I do think, see investment in North Korea as profitable to their own countries and their own companies. If you can uh, lower the barriers to trade, there'd be a, a lot more flow of investment from South Korean companies, particularly who are interested in the low, low wages in North Korea and with uh, Chinese companies that are already uh, or have been already invested in North Korea. Okay, so let's now take a look at the three countries, Japan, China, and South Korea in turn. How will giving financial aid to North Korea affect the South Korean economy? Um, I think it depends very much on what form that financial aid takes. So um, in the past, people have always advised against giving actual aid lump sum mm -hmm. money to North Korea because the government is very practiced and just putting that away somewhere in their coffers and it yeah. not actually entering the economic cycle in a way that benefits anybody other than um, the immediate ruling elite. So um, that would be a bad idea. They shouldn't do that. Um, but I think what the South Korean government and, and South Korean companies who've been starting to set up offices for North Korean liaisons, that kind of thing, what they have in mind is more foreign direct investment, so joint ventures, um, things like the revival of the Kaesong Industrial Complex, which was a, a reasonably successful mm -hmm. form of investing in North Korea, I think. Um, so if they manage to do that and get proper protections for South Korean investors who do invest in the country and the money actually goes to um, the individual workers, say the North Koreans who work in these um, joint ventures, um, that would be beneficial both to North Korea and to South Korea because the, the investors will get something back for that. Um, whereas if you don't have proper protections, I think there's always a risk of the money just going nowhere and mm -hmm. disappearing. So they need to really think about how they do it. Right. So some critics fear that since North Korea's promise to denuclearize can never be trusted, giving financial aid to North Korea to Pyongyang would be both wasteful and a sign that Seoul is getting played by Pyongyang once again. What's your views on that sentiment? This all depends on what denuclearization steps are actually taken, right? Because, I mean, uh, South Korea is also, not only because of the domestic audience and, and the history, like South Korea is also going to have to be very careful. The government itself is going to have to be pretty careful in how it begins sort of investing, right? Because of the criticism um, of what's happened with, uh, with Kim Dae-jung in the past. And so, um, you know, Kim Jong-un has been at the center of unprecedented diplomacy. There are a lot of people who are optimistic that this is signaling a real change, mm -hmm. that he is, for long-term purposes, long-term regime sustainability purposes, he has to kind of has, have his Deng Xiaoping moment, right, and, and oversee an economic opening. Um, it's, the, the test is going to be like how much South Korea and other regional partners are willing to trust that his moves are legitimately different from the past and, and, and in, in good faith. Okay. Then let's move to China and Japan. If China and Japan are interested in giving financial aid to North Korea, which particular areas do you think they might be interested in? I guess that depends on what that would partly depend on what North Korea wants as well and what they demand. But if, if we think about this as a negotiating process where one side offers something and then they get something in return, presumably they'll get to make some kind of specification about what it is they want. Mm -hmm. um, I suspect the first thing that anybody's always going to think about is infrastructure because if you've been to North Korea, the roads outside of Pyongyang just, they basically stop. There's mm -hmm. holes all over the place. There's 
no reliable electricity supply in the countryside. There's lots of places where there's no plumbing, um, which has pretty serious implications for the health of right. the population. And those kinds of things are the first major things that would need to be addressed. Right. Um, and then I guess in the case of China, they're already doing that in a way. Like it's, it's become more difficult over the past few months because of the sanctions. Um, but they have pretty long-standing cooperation with North Korea in the area of textiles, for instance, sort of light manufacturing. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of things that say made in China actually are made in North Korea because wages are lower there and mm -hmm. it's quite easy to um, have cooperation between factories on the border with the Chinese side. So I suspect there'll be an uptick in that kind of thing as well. Right. Lena, you just touched upon this already, but what about from Pyongyang's perspective? Do you think they might be accepting of you know, getting assistance, do you think there's a chance that they might refuse aid from Japan, for example, given the strained relations? The relationship between Japan and North Korea and all of this really does need to change because Japan is in an increasingly untenable position of sticking with maximum pressure. Because mm -hmm. you're seeing even the U.S., which came up with maximum pressure when the Trump administration came in, uh, try and shift to a more diplomatic and pro-engagement tone. And Japan, Abe, is still out here saying, like, don't forget, maximum pressure. You know, so this is not sustainable for Japan, especially because China and South Korea are so pro-engagement. Right. Um, so I do expect that Japan will have to have some sort of symmetry and engagement with North Korea of its own. That s slow process of warming ties is going to have to happen. Um, and is Shinzo Abe sort of the best avatar for that? Probably not, because he came into power on this abductee issue. Mm -hmm. But either way, that's going to have to shift. The um, tone of the relationship and the nature of the Japan-North Korea relationship is going to have to improve before we start talking about aid. Right. Is that your opinion? Yeah, I agree. Uh, if you noticed uh, recently, North Korea has toned down its criticism of the U.S. and, and South Korea, but it has increased its <laughs> right. criticism directly of Japan. Mm -hmm. And, and, and Shinzo Abe, uh, you know, has rushed back for a second meeting with President Trump and is trying to, uh, trying to keep in his ear uh, uh, advocating for a hard line to maintain sanctions until there's strong measures taken in North Korea to end its medium-range missile threat against Japan. Remember, last year, North Korea fired at least two missiles over Japanese airspace. So uh, you know, they're feeling more isolated. Uh, relations with South Korea are, are not uh, as good as they should be over, the, over other issues, including the, the comfort women issue, where uh, uh, South Korea still wants North Korea to, to uh, make a more sincere apology and, uh, about the Japanese military put um, uh, women through in World War II and forcing them into prostitution. Okay. Now, this is the final question. Aside from economic benefits, what other types of reward do you think U.S. will be willing to give Pyongyang if it does, in fact, go through with denuclearization? Well, there's been some indication of that. If you've listened to Donald Trump in the last um, couple of weeks, right? he said things like um, there's going to be a very good relationship between the two countries. Um, uh, there might be some security guarantees for the regime. Um, he, he said that um, he'll make North Korea rich, which is, I guess, the economic assistance, but he'll make it rich with Kim in power, so he hasn't hinted at regime change or um, at any of the other issues that um, other people might have wanted to bring up, say, the, the human rights situation in the country. So he's been very forthcoming in, in his sort of accepting of uh, Kim Jong-un as, as the legitimate leader of the country. And I think that's a very big thing. I mean, people, I think people have sort of started to forget this over the past couple of weeks because um, everyone's so excited about the summit and everyone's thinking, well, what's going to come afterwards? But the fact that this is happening at all right. is already an enormous win for right. North Korea. The fact right. that Kim Jong-un gets to parade around in Singapore with the President of the United States is huge for right. somebody who's wanted the recognition of the world as a legitimate country for exactly. you know the entire time the country's existed. Um, so that's, that's already a big concession up front before anything else has even happened. So that, that sort of thing, the, the legitimacy angle, I think is very important to the North Koreans. Right. I completely agree with you. I think one of the biggest things that they have already achieved, I'm talking about Pyongyang, is that they're now being seen as an equal to all the other world leaders. Right. We'll have to wrap it up there. Do you have any final comments? 
It'll just be interesting to see how the next few weeks and months play out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, it will be interesting to see. I, I think there were a couple points that happened this week about human rights organizations seeming to be pulling back some of its rhetoric and trying to figure out how to work with a, a North Korea that is becoming more normalized mm -hmm. and uh, perhaps uh, less confrontational approach from those organizations and more outreach from them as well. Okay, and Lena? Yeah, I mean, I agree with Elise. I'm, I'm just really curious to see what happens. I've, I've got used to waking up every morning to a breaking news notification, or <laughs> five. Right. Um, uh, yeah, well, we'll see, we'll see whether it goes on that way. Okay, we'll wrap it up there. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts with us. Thank, Thank you for joining Thank me. You. Thank you. From how and where the weapons are discarded to financial aid and security guarantees, there still remain a lot of decisions to be made regarding Pyongyang's denuclearization. And while there is no single perfect answer, hopefully the two Koreas and regional powers can all come together to bring about a feasible solution acceptable to all. That's all the time we have for today. Thank you for tuning in and goodbye.